and we're going to go for the first case, which is uh, case number one, uh, and that is uh, number 18. So if we go down here to number 18, uh, case number one, um, we've got four students, I believe, in the um, uh, in the room, which uh, they should have access to to all of this. I'm going to ask the students as I scroll through. I'm just going to show you some uh, vital anatomy. So here is the CT. And there's the trachea. Oops. There's the esophagus. And there is a blood vessel which is going off to the right hand side. It's going behind the esophagus. And it's arising from the aorta. And this is an aberrant right subclavian artery. Now, in this particular case, the artery is quite big. In fact, it's aneurysmal. And that would cause dysphagia. So it might be something that endoscopically you're not aware of. You may see a slight extrinsic impression. Uh, but in this particular case, it's aneurysmal and so is likely to lead to dysphagia. So uh, case 1A is the next one which is 17 and on exactly the same uh, lines um, it's the MRI of um, this particular problem okay so we have um, a, an aberrant right subclavian artery which goes behind the uh, esophagus OK, and there are uh, ways of imaging this without resorting to radiation. So do consider uh, this uh, when you um, examine uh, patients uh, radiologically. OK, so um, on a barium swallow, of course, the indentation of the esophagus is posterior. So case number three, and I'm going to... Uh, sorry, case number two, beg your pardon, is esophageal pseudodiverticulosis. If we go to number 15, and we've got two images here from a barium uh, study, two different patients. Uh, here's the first patient where we've got um, a barium swallow. You can see that there are food, debris, bubbles in a shouldered stricture. Um, the stricture is actually smooth with these outpouchings. And if we look at the next one in a different patient, this um, is a patient who has got a uh, similar appearance. This is a much smoother stricture with the outpouchings. And this is called intramural pseudodiverticulosis. So this will have a characteristic endoscopic appearance. And in case you've never seen before this is what it looks like radiologically whenever you look at the radiology of the esophagus always remember that it is behind the trachea which is anterior so the esophagus is always behind the trachea but also you've got the link and you can go through these images at your leisure okay so i'm going to give you the answers and you can then go through uh, all the cases so case number three is number 18, um, sorry, number 28, beg your pardon. Um, so go down here, case number three. This is a patient uh, with dysphagia. And sometimes it takes a little time to load. Okay, I might come back to that one. Um, okay, case number four. Which is number Dr. 20. Curtis, can you hear us? I can, yeah. Okay. 
So the connection is established now. Okay, that's great. That's super. So um, just perfect timing because case four has just come up. Um, so this is a patient uh, who has uh, dysphagia. Any thoughts on uh, what the diagnosis might be? It's a barium swallow. And in radiology, we always look at things in more than one plane. So we've got an oblique view. We've got a lateral view. There's the spine posteriorly. There's the trachea anteriorly. Here's the spine um, posteriorly. And this is just the upper part of the pharynx and the upper esophagus. What do you think would cause that sort of appearance in somebody with dysphagia? Any thoughts? Seems to me there is an impression on the distal one third of the esophagus, like a sort of extrinsic compression or? Poss possibly, but let's not worry too much about that at the moment because that could be peristalsis. Don't forget this is a, a snapshot of a dynamic process. I'm, I'm more concerned about the mucosa. What do you think of the mucosa here? Well, the mu mucosa, it should be nice and smooth. And so the outline of the mucosa should be a little bit like this. OK. Uh, you shouldn't see any um, little bumps along the mucosa. And that's because there are tiny ulcerations. There's millions of them along the uh, mucosa of the esophagus. If I told you that this patient uh, was immunocompromised, what would be your diagnosis? With lots of little ulcers. If he is uh, immunocompromised and you have a lot of ulcers, you should think viral in the first place. Yeah, or it was very common in, in HIV patients. It was an AIDS defining illness. Uh, or a fungus. Yeah, it's a candidiasis. You're absolutely right though, a viral infection could look very similar, but actually this is much more common in mm -hmm. uh, candidiasis. And this is a great example of esophageal candidiasis. So for those of you uh, watching in the wider audience, you can go back and have a look at these images and, and see the extent of uh, the ulceration. This is esophageal candidiasis. Now, uh, while we're on the same subject, I'm going to go straight to case number 14, which is the very, very first case here. So if we go to case number 14, this is a great case. 82-year-old guy whose only problem was a little bit of abdo pain, not too much, and vomiting. And so he's got dilated esophagus he's got a very dilated stomach he's got gas in the biliary tree and he's got an enormous filling defect in the first part of the duodenum and then the small and large bowel the large bowel has got feces in it but the small bowel is not dilated at all in fact, I would regard that as normal calibre. The other thing to note is the patient's got a duodenal diverticulum in the second stroke third part of the duodenum. And that might be of interest to somebody doing an ERCP. You may want to know that so that you don't puncture it. But if we explore this a bit further, there's the gallbladder, which is now shrunken. It's got gas in it and it's thick walled. So tell me what's happened. A bit of calcification there and it, it looks as if it's a rounded structure. Maybe Any thoughts? A, a gallstone migration with a fistula? Or or... Absolutely. And where's the fistula? Thing between the gallbladder and the duodenum. 
Oh, yeah, so it's called a cholecystoduodenal fistula because the inflammation in the gallbladder wall eventually causes a fistula to develop between the gallbladder and the next adjacent visceral structure, which is usually the duodenum, but it can be the hepatic flexure of the colon. And in this particular case, it's gone into the duodenum via the fistula, and this is a very large stone. And the reason why you've got gastric outflow obstruction is because the stone is so big it can't actually physically leave the duodenum. And so this is um, gallstone ileus where the stone never actually leaves the duodenum and it's called Bouveret's syndrome. Bouveret's syndrome. Now uh, I will I'll supply everyone with a handout with all the answers so that you can, after the conference is over, you can go back and have a look through uh, all these cases again with with all the answers. Bouveret syndrome, it's a special type of gallstone ileus where you get a cholecystoduodenal fistula but the gallstone is so big it causes gastric outflow obstruction. Okay, um, let's go to case number nine and case number nine is 27 on the on the list. So it's the second to last case and this is an elderly uh, patient who presents uh, with bloody diarrhea and abdominal pain. Okay, so let's get the coronals all booted up. And as we go down this green line indicates at what level I'm taking the axial cuts. As we go down I'll show, show you a bit of anatomy. There's the interventricular septum, there's the left ventricle, there's the right ventricle, there's the coronary sinus which drains the coronary veins into the right atrium, there's the um, IVC, there's the aorta. Here's the liver There's the left liver lobe, so segments one and two. Here's the chordate lobe, sorry, segments two and three. Here's the chordate lobe, which is segment one. And then we've got all the other segments. Uh, I would tell you more about it, but this is a, an endoscopy course. So I'm going to move swiftly on. Now, you can see on the left-hand side that the descending colon is very thick-walled and there is some fat infiltration. So the fat should be nice and black like the fat on the right hand side but we've got some infiltration indicating inflammatory change in the peri-mesencolic uh, fat. Okay and if you look at the right hand side the colon does not produce any fat infiltration on the right hand side. There are formed faeces but the extent of what we're seeing here is quite remarkable, really. There's the splenic flexure. So there it is up here. It's very thick walled. And as we go down into the descending colon, it remains thick walled and it causes this inflammatory change. Now, this must be the transverse colon because this is now dropping down in a peritoneal fashion anterior to the ascending and descending colon and the colon in the transverse portion appears normal about here so we've got a an area of colitis between the mid transverse colon and the distal descending colon there's a little bit of fluid in the pelvis okay and that's probably a reaction to the transverse colitis. It may, um, in younger females, you're allowed some fluid because of ovulation, but this is an elderly uh, female and we've got lots of this inflammatory change. So, anyone know what the diagnosis is? I think it's mostly uh, ischemic because it's an older patient and it's a typical uh, location for it. Brilliant, absolutely, yeah, brilliant, well done. 
And the, the reason why it's ischemic colitis is uh, three reasons. One, it came on suddenly. Okay, so the clinical history is really important. Two, the patients of an age where they can get ischemic colitis and they've got evidence of aortic calcification. Therefore, they have atheromatous disease. And three, as you rightly say, the distribution is absolutely characteristic from the mid transverse colon right down to the distal descending colon. And it means that the inferior mesenteric artery in some way has been occluded either by atheroma or thrombus in situ or sometimes by an embolus. And so the radiologist who reports this also needs to look above the diaphragm just to make sure there's no thrombus in the left ventricle, okay? Because that could potentially be um, a thrombotic source to block up these very small arteries. So this is uh, ischemic colitis. Yeah, well done, that was a, that was a good, good case. Uh, case number 10 is number eight in the scheme of things. So let's go through Now, um, I'm going to ask the four of you on the platform, is this the sort of radiology you like to learn? Or would you rather give um, a boring PowerPoint presentation? I think it's nice there is some interaction because uh, it makes it more interesting. Good. Well, after you've, after you've finished, you, you guys are on the hot seat here and you, you've, you're very brave uh, to do that. But when you uh, leave the conference, um, you can have a look at these at your leisure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, this is case number 10. And it is a patient who is presenting with uh, left iliac fossa pain. Okay, so as we scroll down, uh, I'll just go for the thicker slices because they're quicker to load. If you go for thin slices, you get more resolution but they take a longer time to load so for the purposes of this uh, talk I'm just going to go for the thicker slices and uh, you can see very nicely the descending colon there's the splenic flexure up here and it takes a good few minutes to navigate your way around the large bowel okay now the large bowel is normal except where I'm about to show you as we go from the descending colon into the sigmoid colon, you can see diverticular. The colon is very dilated and we've got uh, infiltration of the pericolonic fat. So what are we dealing with? Diverticulitis. Yeah, diverticulitis. And so uh, what I need to do as a radiologist is I need to do three things. I need to, number one, uh, put it onto lung windows. And I need to look to see if there's any perforation. So I do that by putting it on lung windows. Sometimes you get lots of free gas and then sometimes you just get bubbles of gas in the, um, in the mesentery, okay? Um, and I can't see any uh, extra luminal gas. So this is a, a pure diverticulitis. But the other thing I need to do is I need to look up at the liver and make sure there are no filling defects in the liver because of course that could mean that the patient's got liver abscesses as a direct result of the infection in the uh, wall of the colon being transmitted via the mesenteric veins, via the portal vein into the liver. And the, the most important thing is, always at the back of my mind is, am I missing the carcinoma of the, of the colon? And the honest answer is, we can't always exclude a carcinoma when the uh, bowel is this inflamed. But using Occam's razor, uh, which is basically trying to get the best diagnostic fit for the clinical presentation um, with the appearance of these diverticular and this appearance it's more likely to be diverticulitis 
but I suspect that these patients probably will, will undergo sigmoidoscopy when the acute inflammation uh, subsides. Okay, um, I'm going to jump to case 10C, which is number three. Um, and I'm just going to give you an alternative diagnosis here to somebody with diverticulitis. So this patient um, has also got left eye out fossa pain. And everyone thinks that this is going to turn out to be left um, sided diverticulitis involving maybe the uh, descending colon or... Uh, the sigmoid colon and as we scroll down there's the descending colon a bit of diverticular but the bowel doesn't look too bad it's got feces in it and the uh, mesenteric fat looks okay but if I go back up can you see a torpedo shaped lump of fat with some inflammatory fat around it. Can you see that? Yes. It's more difficult but when you point to it, yes. <laughs> yeah, so when when you go back and have a look at this, uh, just have a closer look at um, images 97 so about images 90 to about 105 just go up and down have a look at that left hand side and you can see this thing here mm -hmm. and that is the appendix epiploechy which is on the serosa of the bowel can sometimes twist and it's torsion of that particular yeah. um, uh, structure now it's lined by peritoneum so when it twists it undergoes infarction and it causes a localized peritonitis at that point but the important thing for the radiologist and the gastroenterologist and the surgeon is that if that is the only abnormality you don't need to offer the patient surgery this is a self-limiting um, process that will get better just with analgesics okay you don't need to do anything else so it's a diagnosis of exclusion